<laughs> you people are weird. You know. Practice problems are it's fun. Just Lexi, not us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, where we're at in the classroom, we've got only two weeks left, and I'm just looking at the schedule and think I can't pack it all in. So we'll see. Anyway, so uh, the things we got to get done is uh, let me first see a few things about the lab report. One more lab report to do, and it's due next Monday. So this one, I'm not holding your hand through it. I'm not going through it piece by piece. I'm just telling you, you've done it. You've mastered the general skill of writing a, a good lab report. So all you got to do now is do it on your own, well, with your group, and get it to me on Monday. If you have questions, if you have things you're uncertain about, come to lab this week. That's the only thing we'll be doing in lab, is we're pretty much done there. So just, if you have questions, come, I'll be sitting there. We can go over rough drafts of your lab report, all that kind of stuff is perfectly fair to do. The other thing is, uh, a few people told me they're still counting flights, is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. You're still counting? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I mentioned that the limit is 10 days after you first started getting F2s. Okay, so that's good because our numbers are a little low this year. Partly it's because we got a smaller class, partly it's because I, I think spring break was at the worst possible time and it kind of desynchronized everybody. And, Made a mess. But anyway, so the numbers are a little low, so anything any that you can, get, can glean will be great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go over the preliminary results so far. I'll show you how to do the calculations. But I'm saying officially, as of Thursday, all entries in the spreadsheet are closed, you're done. That's the final one. So uh, we can do a look at the data so far, get a rough idea where it's going, so you should be able to write everything, and then just update it with the final numbers on Thursday. So that's on my list to do today. Is we're going we're to look at those numbers and see how to do the calculations. Uh, okay, so that's lab. Very exciting. And then uh, the other thing is, we've got an exam coming up on Wednesday. This exam will be a little different from previous exams, because there's going to be more emphasis on essay questions. So you can all give me a great big headache over the weekend. That's okay. So, um, yeah, because I want to just make sure we've got some kind of cumulative understanding of general principles of genetics, so we'll be doing a little bit of that in the exam. But there will also be a few, just a few, mathy sorts of problems. You're all comfortable with those by now. Look at you, you're excited about sample problems. So obviously, maybe I should put more math on it. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I'll also say a few more things about the exam type questions that I'll be putting on in these problems we'll go through right here. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say about all this? Yeah, we're, we're going to be done so soon. Uh, yeah, that means there's only three more lectures after this one. How much can I pack into your brains in that short period of time? I don't know. Anyway, so here's here where we here we are right now. So I want to go over some of our past problems. As you can see right up there on the screen, that was from the last homework assignment, which a lot of people struggled with. This is a really easy problem. Once you see how to break it apart, it just, it's just, it, it looks a little bit confusing and overwhelming, but no, it's, it's really pretty basic once you, once you see how to split up the parts. So we'll go over that, we'll go over a couple other problems. We'll go over the mathematics of the current lab, and uh, then we'll, we'll finally get some cancer genetics on Wednesday. All right, so let's talk about this problem. So it's got a complicated setup, doesn't it? 
Don't be intimidated by that. So I said, okay, you got a, you got racing snails. You have a pure breeding, that's going to be important, pure breeding line, the Morris line, that, you, that has dextral shells with narrow red racing stripes. Okay? You go collecting snails. This is what you all do on your weekends, right? You're collecting snails in Cyrus, and you find a population with narrow green racing stripes, so very different from the ones you've got, but they're also dextral. And then you go off to exotic Hancock. You find broad red racing stripes on another dextral snail. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to take the Cyrus and the Hancock set of snails and you're going to breed them together. And when you do that, the F1s are all dextral. And they all have broad green racing stripes. Okay, the dextral, you, you already know, dextral is going to be maternal effect. So set that aside for a moment. We're going to split the problem. We're going to say, okay, I'm not going to think about the coiling yet, but we will just think about the racing stripes. So we know from this F1 that red and narrow are recessive, right? There's something else we know from this as well, because all of the F1s were broad and green. We know that those snails must have been homozygous for red or green or narrow or broad, right? So we know that because of the F1 ratio. If any of those snails had been heterozygous, you would have gotten a different result. But they're all 100% broad green racing stripes. That's great. That, that simplifies this problem a lot. And, and like I said, we've also simplified it because we're ignoring coiling for now. So we're just going to pretend the coiling doesn't matter. Because then we're going to have to think in a different way about that. Okay, so we take our F1s that are all broad and green, and we're going to cross those, those F1s, so we know they're heterozygous for red and green, right? And we're going to cross those with the Morris snails, which we already know are pure breeding, narrow and red. So that's, that's also a clue. Remember, narrow and red, that, those are both recessive. So we're crossing, our, we're doing a test cross with our convenient homozygous narrow and red striped snails. Okay, so, and we're also going to ignore the coiling. So that means we can take this mess of numbers and crunch it down. So again, ignore the coiling. So we just say, okay, those are green and broad. That's 40 of those. Green and narrow, there's 160 of those, etc. So we can get it down to just four numbers here. See, it's getting simpler by the moment, I hope you think. All right, so we got, we got that arrangement. What we can now do is determine those genotypes. So we know the Morris line has to be little r, little r, little n, little n, right? Because those traits are recessive. And it's pure breeding, so we know it's big D, big D. Okay. Then we ask, what about, what about the Cyrus individual? Cyrus are narrow and green. And we figure that out. That's because we already figured out that they've got to be homozygous. They've got to big, be big R, big R, big N, big N. Forget about the coiling for a bit. We'll come back to that. But we're going to figure out that it has to be heterozygous for the coiling. And then, is there a question? No, sorry, my bag was just making loud noise. <laughs> but was there a question? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I thought narrow was recessive. Or is it dominant? Uh, narrow is recessive. Okay. 
Wait, so are the Cyrus ones narrow or broad? Oh, oh, did I get something wrong here? Sorry. Oh, they're narrow and green. And the other one is broad and red. Oh, good catch. So that should have been big D, little d, big R, big R, little n, little n. And that means this one should be little r, little r, big N, big N. I'm sorry, can you say the Cyrus one one more time? The Cyrus one, uh, because the Cyrus one it's got narrow green racing stripes. It should have been little end, little end. Okay. And then the Hancock individual will be the reverse of that. So it's going to be big R, big R, no, little R, little R, big N, big N. So we, they're both heterozygous. So we end up with heterozygous F1s. Okay, and then the genotype of the F1, they all have to be big R, little R, big N, little N. Again, setting aside coiling for a moment. And then we can just look over here at these numbers and figure out the map distance, right? So this has to be a recombinant, this has to be a recombinant, these have to be the parentals. And that, the, that means the frequency of recombination is uh, 80 out of 400. Yeah, 80 out of 400. So we know the map distance has to be 20. Okay, we good so far? Except for, well, I'll fix that mistake. Anyway, yeah, uh, but that doesn't affect these other things. Okay, what about the coiling? What do we know about the coiling? So they all were dextral snails. And when we looked at the F1s, of the Cyrus Hancock cross. They're all dextral and they've all got the dominant stripes. We forget about the stripes now, just think about this, the coiling. So they're all dextral. And then what we have to do is figure out what's going on with the coiling. Since we see sinistral snail shells here, that means some of the F1s had to be little d, little d, right? They had to be a homozygous for the, that sinistral coiling. So we know that they have to, that the F1s have to be, some of them have to be little d, little d, which means their parents must have been big d, little d. So that tells us, that's this part up here, that tells us this part, big D, little D, big D, little D, for those two, is because of that. And then if we go back to D, where I asked for the genotypes, here's the full genotypes. They are all big R, little R, big N, little N. But a quarter had to be big D, big D, half big D, little D, and one quarter little D, little D. And all the progeny of these will be sinistral coiling. Okay, so the key to this was you gotta split out the maternal effect from all the other stuff. Figure out the other stuff. And then it's just a simple uh, dihybrid cross. And it's then you add in the coiling. And this is one of the nice things about a lot of these genetics problems, is you break them apart into pieces. Solve the pieces individually and then bring them back together again. Okay, here's another one. So I think I only asked you the first one on the exam, but okay, we got Bitcoin is maternal effect gene, and embryos that lack the BCD plus gene product fail to form a head and they die. They never make it to adulthood. Yes? Are you going to post these? Yes. Okay. Yes, they'll, they'll all be posted right after this class. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so we got embryos that lack the BCD plus gene product. If they have none of that, then they fail to form a head and die. You have your BCD minus, BCD minus, you're infertile. You can produce eggs and embryos, but they don't get beyond that. So here I say, okay, we can take a wild type female fly, 
when we cross it with a homozygous recessive bicoid minus male fly. And my first question is, explain how a homozygous recessive BCD minus fly can exist. I know a lot of you got this right. So tell me, how, do you, how does that happen? I'll tell you what I put. Okay. So I got one. I put, wait, let me make sure I got it right. <laughs> oh, I got it half right. Oh. I'm only going to say half of it. Which half, though? I know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> how do you see it? It may not have been half. Is it because that the male can express the mother's phenotype because of maternal effects? Uh, that's that's a confusing way to put it. <laughs> that may be why I got. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's probably uh, yes. Uh, the mother probably had the proteins available inside the cytoplasm. However, his genotype's just different, so he can't produce it himself. Correct. Yeah. So, from this, you know, since you got a, a an existing adult fly, you know that its mother had to have done the job of making bicoid. So it was probably a heterozygous mother who made the bicoid protein, but only passed along bicoid minus gene, the allele. So, and then his, the father must have also done likewise. And that's how you get a, a recessive BCD minus fly to exist. Okay. So yeah, the parents had to be heterozygous and it was the maternally provided BCD that allowed the fly to develop normally. And uh, yeah, like, like your answer, I, a lot of people lost points just because I stared at it and I didn't see how that answered the question. But I, I can, you probably... You one point. Yeah, I mean, you got, you got part way there. I could see sort of, you were thinking the right way, but you didn't give me a clear answer. I just didn't finish the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm asking here. If we do that cross, what are the expected frequencies, genotypes, and phenotypes of the progeny of that cross listed in the first line? Let me give you a hint. Often with these problems, what really helps is framing the question genetically. So what I do is I would say, okay, what are the genotypes of the cross? So that's what our cross looks like. We got a wild type female right here, and we got our weird homozygous mutant male, and we cross those two. And so then, what do you expect to get out of this cross? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. What? Heterozygous. Yeah. So they're all going to inherit. BCD plus from the mom and BCD minus from the father. So that's, yeah, 100% wild type phenotype. All heterozygous. Okay, next part of the question is I take say, okay, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take these flies here and I'm gonna do a back cross to the male parent who is right here. And what are the expected, et cetera, et cetera, of this? So we again, my hint here is just, just figure out what are the, what do I mean by this cross? Boil it down and say, here's the genetics of this cross. We're crossing a heterozygous female with a homozygous recessive male. So what do we expect to see in this cross? Yeah. Well, the phenotypes of all of them, they'll all be okay and they'll live. Yes, they, were, they all are going to get BCD plus from mom, so they'll all be fine. Yes. What about genotypes? Some be half will be heterozygous and half will be homozygous. Exactly, yes. So we get 50% are going to be uh, BCD plus, BCD minus. The others are going to be BCD minus, BCD minus. And that also illustrates how we can get 
the homozygous fly with PCB mice. Notice also that some of those, those flies will be females. So we get females that are BCD minus out of this. So you can do all kinds of fun experiments with flies that way. Okay. Let's go back old school for a minute. Triple point crosses. You all remember those. You, you, you're finishing one up right now. So here I'm giving you some numbers. So I've got three X-linked, that's important, three X-linked recessive alleles. We've got ruby eyes, singed bristles, and cross veinless wings, and I cross them. And I get those numbers over there. Okay. Which gene is in the middle? How would you figure that out? You notice right away, this, this table is terrible. It's not organized at all. It's just, here's all these different fly mutants and numbers associated with them. I think I give a clue here. Yeah. So first question, what is the genotype of the F1 flies? And the F1s are going to be, 50% are going to be mutant Y males, so they will express the mutant phenotype. This is just like your white miniature forked males. And 50% are going to be heterozygous. So that's what we want. We want those heterozygotes, and we're going to produce an F2. That's what we're looking at over there. We're going to produce an F2 where recombination has occurred in this female. And then we're going to mate them with this male and we'll be able to expose the frequency of the different recombinants. Okay. So one of the first things we do is categorize the different mutations. So you look at the most frequent are the non-crossovers, right? And then I usually go for the double crossovers next. Which ones are the double crossovers? RBSN and CD. Yeah, so we identify those. Uh, then you've got enough information you can stop and you can say, okay, which one's in the middle? CV. CV, you say, how did you figure that out? Because if you compare the non crossover and the double crossover, the CV is the outcome. Yeah, so something has rearranged here to put CV differently than it is in the, in the non-crossovers. And uh, it was a double, you know it was a double crossover. So it took two crossovers to get just our, our CV out of arrangement. So that tells you CV has got to be in the middle. Okay. Now we want to figure out map distances. All right, we, we can tell right away those remaining ones are single crossover events, right? So there's all the single crossovers. Now I want to figure out the map distance from RB to SN, it says. Oh, wait, no. I, I looked at this and I said, oh, that's, that's a tricky question. Let's do this one first. Because remember, CV is in the middle, as we just figured out. So we know CV is in the middle. So what's the distance from RB to CV? We have to look over there and figure out which of those are single crossover events between RB and CV. Which ones do you think they are? Maybe I'll help. Oh, I'm right. Yes. Why I didn't you didn't say, say it? it Be brave. Go okay, ahead and throw um, it out there. The 310 and 261. So, for the distance. Okay, that's distance from CV to S. Oh, wait. This is CV to SN, and that means these other two are. RB to CV. 
Did you still get it right? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so for instance, the only way you could get... You have to do them both, right? Yeah, you could get, you get a single crossover here, for instance, would produce a fly that has got just RB and wild type for the other two alleles. Can you just add them together? Yeah. And then, then, of course, the other trick, the devious thing I did in this problem is that the numbers of the single crossovers are all about the same. Right? They kind of wobble around. So we know this is RB to CB. Okay. And it's got a distance of 310. Then we had to figure out the other one, is, which is RB to CB, which has to be this combination, and that's 260. You can't just use the numbers. You might be tempted. Hey, 310, 320, those are awfully close. But as you know from what you've seen in the lab, there's a lot of wobble, a lot of variation in the numbers of the different phenotypes. So you have to work that out. So we got RB to CV is 310 and 260. So that's one combination. It's 570. All out of a convenient 10,000 total. So the map distance from RB to CV is 6.15. Because remember, you also add in the double crossovers. So there's our single crossover, crossover categories plus the double crossover categories. Divide by 10,000 and we got our distance, 6.15. Okay, now we can go back to this one. So we know CV to RB is 6.15. What's the distance from RB to SN? And remember, it's RB, CV, SN. So we're asking for the whole distance. So to get that, we're going to take the remaining ones, this one and this one, we add those up, add the number of double crossovers to that, and divide by 10,000, and that says the distance from SN to CV is 7.3, but we want to know the distance from uh, RB to SN, so we have to add this distance to it as well. We get 13.45. Okay. See, that's one of those devious things I can do on a problem, is just assume, hey, you guys don't know which one's in the middle yet, so I can just pick any two and say, what's the distance between those? And sometimes you get numbers like this. All right, what's the coefficient of interference? Remember how to figure that one out? So we got to ask, what should we have seen for the frequency of double crossovers? The expected frequency of double crossovers. And how do you calculate that frequency? It's the likelihood that you'll get a crossover between RB and CV, and also between CV and SN, right? The probability of those two events occurring at the same time. So you just multiply 0 0.0615 times 0 0.073, and that should give you the expected frequency of those. And then we look at our frequencies of DCOs, that's 35 plus 10, it's 45 over 10,000, whatever that is. Okay, so we expected. 4.49% double crossovers. And we observe 45 out of 10, which is 4.5%. Wow, that is so close. So for once, we've got a number that's really close. And then the coefficient of error interference is 1 minus 4.5 over 4.49, well, minus 0 0.002. So very little interference in this example. Everyone sees all this? Okay. We'll do another one in just a moment. 
Uh, I just want to mention how, how I'm going to do things in the next exam on Wednesday. And I said, we'll have, we'll have some essay questions. Here's some examples. How do you distinguish between a mitochondrial disorder and a maternal effect? Yeah? Maternal effect, I don't think, would be often seen as disadvantageous, where a disorder of the mitochondria would often harm the offspring. Okay, that's... That's not necessarily true, though. So, yeah, that, that's one thing you can look at, it's just the phenotype. And you'd say, okay, the mitochondrial effect is usually deleterious. Well, maybe always deleterious. The maternal effect exa examples we've talked about, not necessarily so. But no, that's not going to work. That's not going to be, that's not going to be the way we distinguish them. What if you've got a maternal effect that is deleterious? What's the difference in inheritance? Go ahead. Look at the genotype then? Because if it's maternal effect, the offspring might not have in their genes. This is a genetics class. We don't do that, no, yeah. <laughs> Medically, yeah, that might be a good way to do it. Is um, you've got a mother who's got a history of, for, for instance, muscle weakness or eye problems and things like that. You might say, okay, well, we should we should be examining the makeup of your cells to see if that's a problem. And that's that's a possibility. But in pure genetics, we just do crosses. Yeah? Can you um, isolate like maternal effect genes and then inject them into cells that don't have that? And then will they adapt that? Because mitochond oh. in mitochondrial genes, you can. So do a rescue experiment. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one way to do it, sure. But I'm thinking of a, of a clearer difference in how these get inherited. That you can have a perfectly healthy mother who, through maternal effect, gives birth to offspring that are affected by the trait. You won't see that with mitochondrial disorders. If, you're, if mom has a mitochondrial disorder, 100% of her children will inherit that disorder to varying degrees. So, yeah, the answers you guys gave me, uh, you know, I, I give partial credit for that. Th those are pretty thoughtful answers. But the key thing is, is the mode of transmission. Mitochondrial disorders, 100% of the progeny to get them. Okay, what about that second question? What is imprinting, and what is uniparental disomy, and how does disomy contribute to the effects of imprinting? First one, what, is, what the heck is imprinting? I told you. Did it sink in? Okay, that's that's everything is a pattern of methylation. <laughs> a lot of gene regulation. Um, gene imprinting is has got a it's got a sex dependent effect. So you're right, there's methylation involved. There's modifying the expression of genes on the chromosome. You just have to work in. The male. state of the mutant allele can be different depending on whether it's imprinted from the male or female? Yes, okay, so that's that's a better explanation. So yeah, you want to throw that in, that somehow uh, male 
genes from the male, which are not sex genes, for instance, have a different pattern of regulation than genes from the mother. All right, so that leads us to uniparental disomy. So we just said, okay, the, the thing with imprinting is, it's which parent you get it from that affects the expression of that particular allele. And then I say, okay, what is uniparental disomy? That's a big hint right there. So that when non-disjunction doesn't occur in one of the parents? That's the first step, yeah. So we get non-disjunction in, uh, in the offspring, in, in the gametes. And so we get, for instance, a zygote that's trisomic. Mm -hmm. And that'll cancel out one of those too. How? What's the next step? Mm -hmm. So we got we got a we got a little zygote, an innocent little embryo in the beginning, who's got a trisomy, who's got three chromosomes. But this kid is going to be born. So something happens. We're going to spontaneously shed one of those chromosomes. And this is, this is a fairly common occurrence. Uh, a trisomic cell is not a healthy cell. Uh, it may be able to limp along for a while, but will, what will sometimes happen is it will lose spontaneously one of those redundant chromosomes and back down to disomic. So it's disomic at this point. Now we just have to link up uniparental and disomy. What's the key thing that happens here? Which chromosome do we lose? So one parent has contributed two chromosomes, and the other parent has contributed one chromosome, and then we randomly lose one of those three chromosomes. So let's say, for example, mom contributed, had a, had a non dysfunction and she contributed two copies of chromosome 15. Dad contributed his normal one. He got a child that is now trisomy 15. And it's going to lose a chromosome. Which chromosome does it want to lose? Dad's father's. Did you say mother's? The father's. Oh, if it loses dad's chromosome, it's left with two maternally imprinted chromosomes. And then you got problems. So we want to lose one of the mothers? If we lose one of the mother's chromosomes, then we got a balance set. We got one chromosome 15 from mom, one chromosome 15 from dad, and they've got complementary imprinting. So our little embryo gets the full complement. Of, of active genes and is healthy. If it's all from one parent, you're going to have problems because the genes that dad normally contributes are inactivated in the mother. Okay, this is the kind of question I'm going to be asking on the next exam. I may actually throw in one of these questions, you never know. I'm giving you an edge here. So are there any other questions about this? Because the next thing I want to do is go through the lab data. Yes? Wait, can you talk again about on the first one with oh. the mitochondrial disorder, how that would be different? Okay, so you could have an, an individual who's got a mitochondrial dis disorder, a female, all of our children are going to be affected, right? But if you've got a maternal effect, you could have a mother who's homozygous for the defect, right? And in that case, all of her children will be affected. 
or she could uh, be heterozygous, mm -hmm. and then only half of her children will be affected. Okay. So we'll see a difference in frequency mm -hmm. of the effect passing on to the next generation. All good? Yep, thank you. Okay. Okay, let me pull up. Let me pull up some data here. Oh boy. I threw it into a spreadsheet even. Looks familiar? So there's our there's our numbers for the class. We got a total of 2707. And we're only going to look at the total. So when you're writing up your lab report, there is no reason to discuss individual group results unless uh, there's something significantly anomalous about them. And you want to bring up the distinction. So we're just going to focus on, on uh, those lovely critters down there. The 2,707 we got to work with. All right, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to clump the data a little bit. We're going to simplify a bit. We're going to just look at non-crossovers, the two double crossovers, and the single crossovers. All right, so the non-crossovers are, um, is this everyone? Wild type, wild type, well, yeah, okay. So the non-crossovers are these four up here, right? So I'm going to just say, okay, give me the sum So we got 1,385 non-crossovers. Sound about right. Yeah, so it should be about half. That's about what we got, about half non-crossovers. Does everyone have spreadsheets set up so they can just plug numbers in and get these in? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a good idea. All right, then uh, we'll just jump down to the double crossovers. Let's take a look at the frequency of double crossovers. So that's these four down here. Just making sure. Okay. So we got 187 double crossovers. Now, notice also that I'm doing things like, I'm just saying, I'm just ignoring sex for now. Just saying, forget that. We're doing the simplest calculation possible. Uh, you may want to bring up sex in your analysis. Like if I'm looking here, I notice, okay, yeah, pretty consistently, males are under, well, except for these guys. Males are kind of underreported, right? So that, that may be a factor. You may want to do an analysis of that. The other thing is I am kind of lumping together. Notice I'm lumping together wild type and white miniature fork because those are the parental arrangements. I'm just saying, okay, that's, those are non-crossovers. But there may be significant differences between an all-mutant and an all-wild-type arrangement of alleles. And I think you can see it here. Look at there. Oh, there's, what, 800-and-something wild-type, and there's more like 500-and-something triple mutants. So that's another thing you may want to pull out and talk about to explain some of the disparities we're going to see from what we expect. Okay, then, single crossover between white and miniature. Which of these was that? So we got this one is between miniature and fort. So it's got to be these four right here, right? All right, that means that the last one, the crossovers between miniature and fork, that is got to be um, this one through here. Okay. We've broken them up into these nice tidy categories. And 
Oh, look at a fly crawling on the screen. Oh well. Anyway, uh, once we've done this, we can start saying, okay, well, what about the map distances? So the map distance between white miniature and white miniature is going to be uh, equals, let's see, this. Is that the right thing? Yeah. That's going to be that plus our double crossovers. You've got to add in the double crossovers divided by that the total number of flies. I know I whipped that by pretty fast, but you all see how that calculation goes. We're just adding up everything in that category plus double crossovers, and that's going to give us that frequency here. And then similarly here, we're going to go um, this number plus, and add again the double crossovers, divide by that. So this would say, let me reformat this a little bit, because you don't need that many decimal places. Let me just see over here. Uh, we just want... We'll just say one right now. No, we better say. Well, we also want it in a percentage format. Okay, that's good. So, according to the data as of today, you have reported that you have figured out that the distance between white miniature is 28.7 map units, and the distance between miniature and fort is 27. Does that sound good? Sound about right? Okay, again, if you guys get those last few numbers in, this may change a little bit, so you may have to redo this calculation, but that's fine. I, I don't think we'll get a significant difference. Now, down here, I put some other numbers. Okay, I looked this up on Flybase, and let's see, white was at location 1-1.5, so it's at 1.5 map units. And miniature, uh, miniature was at 36, and forked was at 57. So that I can figure out the distances that I expect from this cross, right? So we should have gotten a map distance of 34.5 for white to miniature. You guys got 28.7. You failed. Oh no. Uh, we also see that miniature fork should be 21, but you got 27. What's going on here? Yeah. Human error is probably involved in it. That's, yeah, so again, for your discussion, you're going to need to talk about this disparity. Yeah, so human error is probably one. You guys did pretty good for it. The, your first semester playing with flies. I hope you spend many more playing with flies. Don't cry, it's okay. So that's one possible answer. What else? One that we can't blame on you. The flies ability to reproduce. The flies are what? The flies ability to reproduce. Oh, so we, yeah, we got other imponderable factors, like I mentioned, triple mutants probably didn't do as well as the you know the wild types, uh, so that may affect it. Anything else? Here's another important thing. Remember I, when I told you about mapping? I said when you are doing professional mapping of this sort, you want genes that are really close together, right? Because otherwise, you know, the, the frequency of triple and quadruple and pentuple crosses just messes everything up and confuses you. So you you're underrepresent what you expect to see. Are these genes very close to one another? No, they're terribly far apart. Yeah, so they're, you know, they're between the two farthest, we're what, uh, 1.5 minus 57, we're, we're 55.5 map units apart. If we were just doing this experiment with those two, just doing a dihybrid cross those, you'd say they're unlinked. 
So these are really far apart. So that's going to mean, mean that there's a lot of potential errors in here. There's a lot of unobserved crossovers that you can't account for. Uh, here's another possibility. It, could it be just statistical error? Maybe, maybe your numbers are right in the ballpark of what we'd expect from random variation. How would you test that? I know it's been so long since I made you do this, but we have a, we have a statistical test, right? Chi-square. Yeah, we could use a chi-square on this. Of course, to do a chi-square, what we need to do is figure out the expected number of flies we should have seen. Okay. You cannot do a chi-square comparing 28.7% to 27% to 34.5% to 21%. That is not allowed. That's, that's bad statistics, so you don't want to do that. What you need to do is get a set of numbers that you can compare these, these over here to from the expected distances. And how do we do that? Well. We're just going to have to do our calculations in reverse. Okay, if if we had 34.5% uh, was our, our map distance, we expected that frequency. Uh, first thing to figure out is what should the number of what should the number of DCOs be, and how do we get that frequency? The expected frequency of DCOs would be just again. We we don't get to use these numbers. We have to stick to these <laughs> numbers here. How many double crossovers would you expect from this? Seven percent. 7%? Uh, about, yeah, because you, how did you do that? That's, I multiplied those two numbers together. <laughs> oh man, that's just magic. Yeah, so you multiply that times that. And so we should have seen 7.245% double crossovers. And that number would be, uh, let's put it over here, out of the way. That would be this number times the total number of flies. And so, you know, if we repeated this and we got 2,707 flies again, uh, we would expect, oh, that's not right. No, that's not right. Oh, is it because I got this as a percentage and that's an, oh yeah, no, 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 no. So that's gotta be, let me think how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna take 28. Which one is which? Now I'm all confused. Oh, yeah, okay. I just have to do a little extra division in here. So I'm going to turn that into that. No, that didn't do it. Oh, because I... Okay. What am I doing wrong here? So this should be... It's just type it out physically. That should be point zero seven two four five times two thousand seven hundred and seven. That's more like it. Okay. So we should have seen a hundred and ninety six point one two 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 etc. Double crossovers. We saw hundred and eighty seven. That's pretty good. That's pretty close. Got to do a chi-square to say how close it is, though. All right. Then the frequency of these guys we should have seen of miniature to forked would have been uh, 0 0.21 times that number again minus going to subtract these out this time. 
So we should have seen uh, 372 of the miniature to fork crossover. Oh, you guys counted too many there. That's a problem. We do a similar calculation here. So we should have seen uh, 0.345 times that. Oh, let's get those parentheses in there. Minus this number again. So we should have seen 730. There you, you undercounted. And again, when you look at the percentages, that's about right, right? That's kind of what you'd expect. And then uh, how many of the non-crossovers should we have seen? It should have been, um, let's do this minus the sum, sum, come on, uh, those three, everything left over. So we should have seen about 1400. Yeah, so we, we got that one about right. Those are pretty close, right? Does pretty close count. Now then we got we got to do the chi-squared test. Y'all remember how to do chi-squared, right? Yeah. So, I'll let you guys do it. Go, give me a chi-squared test on this and tell me if those, those numbers might possibly be within the realm of statistical possibility to be the same. So again, we're comparing this and this for our chi-squared. and see if I can get it. So we want, what's this first step in this thing? It's expected over, do you want to get observed minus, okay. We want that number minus that number. That's observed, so minus, and then we got it. We got to square that. So that's going to be that times that again. And then we're going to divide that by the expected number. So I'll just plug it in here. And again, the expected was right there. Okay. And then if I line these all up right, I can just do this. And that means the chi-square value is... Oh, come back. Equals... Oh. Does that sound close to what you guys got? Chi-square value 110? Fairly big number anyway. Oh, and then I didn't bring my chi-square table with me. Anyone got one? So we got a chi-square value 110 with three degrees of freedom. I bet you the p-value is gonna be pretty small. It's yes. going to be, yeah, it's going to be smaller than 0 0.005. Okay. So, you guys, what'd you do wrong? You got a number that's significantly different from expected. F Solaran, is that the, no, that's not how it works. So, that's the kind of thing you have to do for this final lab report is look at the final set of numbers, do this kind of calculation, get a chi-square value, which I know it, it, every year it's way, way off for the reasons we already mentioned. Got to give that, got to explain why it's so far off. But you know, I look at this and I say, hey, at least you got the right gene in the middle, right? 
And the numbers are kind of ballparkish. Big numbers, fairly far distant from each other, but those are going to be inaccurate anyway. And then also what I want to see is that you do a little deeper dissection of the data. So as you know, we mentioned, look at male versus female ratios. They should have been one to one. They're not, but they never are in flies. Uh, look at the effects of these mutations. So um, for instance, we could look at the effects of fort. So here's one with fort, here's one with fort, no fort here, fort, 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 oh, fort. Uh, yeah, you could just, there's eight different categories here that all have the fort mutation. And that should have been 50% of the total, right? Should have been 50% of 2,707. Similarly, you can look at miniature. Just look through and find all the ones that express miniature versus wild type. Uh, the miniature should have been 50%. And similarly with white. And you might be able to get an idea which of these mutations is most deleterious by comparing those numbers. It could also be a measure of how difficult it was for students to score fort. But you guys figure that out. So that's what I'm looking, you know, now you know what to do with the lab report and the kinds of things I'm going to be looking for is you do a good, simple mathematical calculation of the statistics of these things, uh, that you have a discussion that talks about reasons why they deviate from the expected, and also it'd be nice to see something a little further, like can we blame this on a particular mutation? Is, is it all the males' fault? Things like that. Look at the statistics of those differences as well. Okay, very good. Uh, so again, yeah, Wednesday I'm planning to talk about genetics of cancer and I will give out the exam that day. There's a sail through and he said, yes? Is the exam due Sunday or Friday? Uh, oh, I haven't said it due to you. What do I usually, I usually set it for Friday. Is there a reason I shouldn't do it on Friday? No, that's perfect. I'd rather have it due then so I don't have to do it on the weekend. Yeah, because you can have a lab report to work on over the weekend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, very good. So I may see some of you in lab this week if you've got questions about the lab report.